All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be back with you today, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Powerful Drone Components Take Flight Together in DIU's Blue UAS Ecosystem. If you don't know, my name is Keely Griffith, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic Programs at AUVSI, and lucky enough to be your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, we have a few boring housekeeping items before we get into the good stuff. Um, as always, all participant lines will be muted during today's webinar. A recording of the program is in progress, and a viewing link will be emailed to all attendees within the next week. You can now view all of our webinars on AUVSI's new learning and engagement platform, ABLE, making your experience much more seamless. If you're listening to the broadcast and you need assistance at any point in time, please send a note to the webinar leader using the chat at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all links featured in the slides will be shared through the chat during the presentation, so you can easily grab those. Our speakers will be taking questions throughout the presentation. Attendees, you're encouraged to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please note, this is a different box than the chat, so please submit all content questions using the Q&A, which can be found next to the chat. It says Q&A. <laughs> so let's get started. We'd very much like to welcome back and thank our sponsors, Doodle Labs, for their support today. And joining us are five excellent speakers, Matthew Browski, the Technical Program Manager at the Defense Innovation Unit, Stephen Freeberg, CEO, UXV Technologies, Nuno Mark, oh, Marx, he, he helped me with this earlier, <laughs> the Government Engineering Manager at Arterian, Ash Freak, VP of Business Development at Doodle Labs, and Nate Lipka, Senior Marketing Manager at Doodle Labs. All right, Matthew currently leads DIU's Blue UAS program, managing several small unmanned aircraft systems development and prototyping programs, while partnering with DOD program offices to adapt and field commercially derived robotics technologies to address critical warfighter needs. Stephen Freeberg is the CEO of UXV, um, technologies, which he founded in 2014 and has since pioneered innovation within drones and robotics, specializing in ground control, stations, and sensors. Stephen has worked in the drone and robotics industry for more than 15 years and is regarded as one of the founding fathers of the modern, innovative Danish drone ecosystem. Beyond being CEO of UXV Technologies, Stephen Fruberg is also vice president for the government's climate partnership under the Danish Ministry of Defense. Nuno Marx is the engineering manager at Arturian with seven plus years of software engineering, program management, and robotic systems integration experience, with five of those years as a freelance consultant for the drone industry. He has a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering and, the, and served with the Portuguese Military Academy. He is also an army veteran that dedicated 11 years to the Portuguese army and reached the rank of captain. He's been an active contributor to the PX4 autopilot and the overall open source robotics and drones ecosystems since 2014. No has extensive technical leadership and development experience in programs with the U.S. Department of Defense, and he's currently leading the robotics and autonomous systems air interoperability profile development with the DOD and industry organizations on behalf of Arturi and GS. Ash Parikh currently leads sales and operational efforts for Doodle Labs, a leading manufacturer of long-range mesh radios for mobile robotic systems. Parikh heads up Doodle Labs government programs and spearheaded the company's initial collaboration with DIU and the development of the Helix Mark Radio. And last but certainly not least is Nate Lipka. He's a member of Doodle Labs marketing department. He has a background in journalism, corporate communication, and tech industry marketing. So we're thrilled to have you all with us today. Obviously, a lot of experts in the room. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Nate, and I look forward to some great questions and discussion. Thanks, Keely. And thanks so much to AVSI for hosting this webinar panel. Powerful drone components take flight together in DIU's Blue UAS ecosystem. As Keely said, I'm Nate Lipka, Senior Marketing Manager at Doodle Labs. I'll be proctoring today's um, discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so Defense Innovation Unit's Blue UAS is a holistic and continuous approach to rapidly prototyping and scaling capable and secure commercial UAS technology for the Department of Defense. The DoD sponsored the development of innovative new drone technology, and the Blue UAS program has made it easier for government agencies to procure commercial drone tech that's cleared for use by the DoD. Now, this is a win for the government in general and the DoD in particular, as they're able to get their hands on drone technology, which, as all of you know, is ever evolving and improving and, and has very obvious and beneficial use cases for the DoD, from tactical deployment and contested battle space 
to more routine use cases like maintaining base infrastructure, routine patrol and surveillance and the like. Um, Blue US also presents as a big opportunity for commercial drone industry players, opening the door for platform manufacturers, component providers, and software companies to sell into a sizable DoD market that's hungry for technology and through this program is removing barriers to procure it. Um, really, there, there are several interesting narratives at play here um, tied up in the Blue US concept. Um, there's the policy aspect, a uh, very distinct roadmap for business partnership between commercial and DoD interests. Um, there's obviously no shortage of programs with this type of touch point um, between government and industrial interests, but it's really quite fascinating how quickly and comprehensively this program has come together in full scope um, versus many others. Um, there's also the story of rooted in financial interests, how uh, success stories within the defense related drone space might reflect a larger shift toward uncrewed autonomous and other advanced technologies across the DoD and what that might mean for the tech and robotics interests in the short and long term in general. Um, but really, we here at Doodle Labs, we're technologists. We develop radios for drones, ground robots, and connected teams to allow these platforms and people to travel farther, to transmit larger, larger data payloads, to unlock cool new capabilities and advancements that until recently um, some ha had never been dreamed of. Um, so we'd like to focus on the technology, how it works, who it helps. Um, so that's really why we're here today on this webinar, um, striking up a conversation with DIU and Autirian and UXV. Um, we're all part of the Blue US ecosystem of drone component manufacturers. We hold that in common. Um, we're pushing the envelope in the development of new technologies. Um, we're definitely not working in a vacuum either, um, but rather uh, collaborating to build powerful new integrations and capabilities and, and sometimes entirely new use cases, um, benefiting not only defense agencies, but other governmental, commercial, and industrial companies and, and the entire U.S. industry, in fact. Um, so in today's session, we'll uh, dig in to get a little bit of a background on Blue U.S., where it's come from, where it's at, where it's headed. Um, we'll talk to these great panelists already inside the Blue program to get their pr perspective on um, selling uh, and serving into this market, um, collaborating on new technology, and in a lot of ways, um, dictating the future of the drone industry at, at large. And of course, um, we'll have a closer look at some of the specific technology um, already being developed and deployed, um, not only in the DoD sphere, but for commercial and industrial outfits as well. Um, so I think a good spot to start, a logical spot to start would be to bring in our voice from DIU itself, uh, Matthew Borowski, Technical Program Manager for the Defense Innovation Unit. Matthew, um, thanks so much for joining us once again. Yeah, my pleasure, Nate. Thanks for having me. So we had you on for another AAVSI webinar um, in late 2022. Um, we talked specifically about the development of, of Doodle Labs Helix Mesh Rider Radio. It's a data link developed for Blue US Framework line of effort. Um, one thing that really stood out to me and stuck with me uh, was really just how jazzed you were about the interoperability of UAS components and software and, and the collaboration between um, Blue vendors to make it happen. Um, can you speak to why this type of collaboration is, is important to the program and, and maybe so interesting to you personally? I remember it well. Uh, yeah, my, my past five and plus years of DIU, I remember just about everything that we've gone through here with small UAS has been quite the journey. And before I begin, I see a lot of uh, familiar names in the participants uh, chat. So, you know, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, interoperability is critically important. I mean, you could list the, the the reasons. I mean, high level, the ability to swap components, the ability to build off a common baseline so we don't have to keep reinventing the same technologies over and over again. I mean, quite frankly, small UAS is, a, is still a very nascent uh, new industry. It's one that's growing fast and, and one that, you know, we feel like the U.S. and allied markets are, are behind it and compared to other other countries. So we need to make sure we've got a place to build off of. Um, so in our ability for that reason uh, starts there, right? You have to start from somewhere where you can get from zero to flight quickly, then work on the really particular uh, unique use cases that you bring that your system solves. Um, there's others too. I mean, everything from being able to interconnect to other systems, which may or may not have been designed by that company. Um, that becomes very important for the military where we have other C2 networks, other nodes that we have to connect these systems into. Um, but yeah, I mean, what we've seen to date has been uh, a lot of industry going out and solving problems, great, uh, but not the standards. And so, you know, Blue UAS in the past few years has really gotten into standards development, particularly around um, what was brought in the intro, which is the new protocol standard uh, for the commercial market, part of the joint reference architecture called the RAS AIOP, the Robotic Autonomous System Air Interoperability Profile, which we'll talk about on this call a bit. But uh, overall, interoperability has to be at the front of everyone's minds. If we don't have uh, standards, we can't ever achieve that. Cool. Yeah, I know last time it was really helpful, but I know you have a couple of slides for kind of an overview of the structure of Blue US. I think it'd be really great to jump into that. So let me share my screen here and um, 
if you could walk us through that, I think it'll set the scene and kind of um, have a visual of where, where, where the panelists really on this call sit within the whole process. So take it away, Matthew. Yeah, certainly. I got a couple slides on Blue UAS, and really, Blue UAS doesn't exist without DIU. You know, without Defense Innovation Unit, Blue UAS would not be here. Um, and we get some really exciting news too, as well from DIU. We now have new leadership. Uh, Mr. Doug Beck is going to take over as the director of DIU, and we're now also. I have to change my my talk a bit because we used to say we're part of OSD's uh, research and engineering. We're now under Secretary of Defense directly, so we will no longer be reporting to another undersecretary. We'll be back to how it was back in 2017 which is DIU reporting directly to the Secretary of Defense, which I, I think is great. Um, but Blue UAS really stems from uh, the creation of the work that we did on behalf of our DOD partners, absent really any formal joint coordination effort. You know, Blue UAS grew up as a uh, the first start to be a whole of DOD solution to how do we get and use small unmanned aircraft systems uh, within the confines that DOD has to, to buy and operate these. Um, and and we, we align all of our work to Blue UAS to gain efficiency, um, to gain efficiencies in how do we uh, get our commercial partners to grow stronger and stimulate the domestic industrial base, uh, put domestic and allied, because we actually get a lot of components from our allied countries. Uh, at the same time, we're also serving as a path to streamline how we would procure small UAS. You know, without having some kind of centralized program, it becomes sort of the Wild West and how you would uh, access and maintain, um, you know, so we try to serve as a, not a filter per se, but maybe a, a, a vet between, a vetting process between commercial industry and the DOD. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, while we're doing this, we also have a really unique opportunity to begin to align our vendors that serve Blue UAS towards uh, commercially derived standards and protocols. That increases our ability to use, and it also improves our capabilities that we bring along the way. Um, and we've actually partitioned out this overarching Blue US program into uh, was five going down to three lines of efforts. So we've consolidated a little bit, but uh, you probably heard each one of these or maybe two of these at some point, but our clear list effort, our foundry effort, and then our hub. Uh, so next slide, I've got a little bit of a breakdown about what these are and what it means to people. Actually, sorry, next one. Um, before I get into that, uh, Blue US is uh, as an on-ramp process to get systems from the commercial market into the DoD. You know, we are not meant to be a gatekeeper. We aren't prohibiting anybody from joining the DoD. We just provide one means for systems that don't have another um, DoD partner or a process to get on to have a chance to to become part of the DoD. So again, I mentioned before, like absent any kind of joint coordination office, most programs, people, users have to figure this out on their own. You know, we provide those that don't have that the ability to align to something. Um, and it's been it's been quite successful. It's been a multi-year effort with a lot of uh, different resources, people, commercial vendors along the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the kind of the opposite ends are you in the left, you either have to make it a memo, a waiver each time you want to use a drone for every single system, right? And that can't scale very well. And then on the right, you have programs of record, which can buy systems on mass but they have a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, constraints put along them. Blue US is meant to be uh, less chaotic than our COTS uh, waiver process, but not quite as rigid as a program of record. So kind of trying to fit right in, neatly in the middle of there. It's, it's never that clean, but that's our intention. The uh, next slide actually is the, the, three, the three lines of effort. Uh, so the top one, this is what people call Blue US a lot of the systems that end up on our cleared list, which are colleagues at OSD Acquisition and Sustainment. I'll call it OSD ANS. Uh, they manage this. There's a list of drones that have gone through the on-ramp, which is the Blue SUAS 2.0 CSO that was launched about 18 months ago. Um, so this isn't a thing where it's it's not um, uh, rolling admissions, right? There's not a process by which it's always open. This is more like when you sign up for insurance and you have a period of time you have to sign up by. And if you don't, you don't have insurance. Like that's what the on-ramp is currently, uh, at least with Blue UAS. Um, the green UAS is meant to be a bit more of a rolling admissions type thing. But with Blue, there's a period of time where you can submit. We announce when that's open. We tell when it's closed. And that's that's pretty much it. But that's how we get systems uh, into on the clear list. For uh, systems that are not quite taken directly off of industry and product of DOD, things have to be modified or, or tweaked. Uh, we call that our foundry. And that's where we actually use DIU's proven commercial solutions opening. I'll call it CSO process to take a problem statement and then to put solutions into place that can help solve that. 
everyone you'll see on this call uh, for panelists are going through the foundry effort. They're developing uh, DOD or Asmolius components for the DOD based on what they've already had um, successfully working with in the commercial industry, but modified mostly around our standards, but also for performance as well. Um, and then the last one is Hub. This is our chance to uh, have a place where DOD folks can get access to all the paperwork. It is uh, DOD only. It does require a CAC. Uh, if you do have a common access card, you can go on and access this. I can give you the link. Uh, but as of right now, it does require authentication. But that's our a place to post documents, certifications. We have different paperwork in the DOD we have to have in place for each drone. Things like authority to operate, interim flight clearances, airworthiness certificates, all that's going to be posted on the hub. And that way, there's a place where people can access it across the DOD. But yeah, the, these are our three uh, lines of effort. Um, one more slide, and I'll I'll turn it back over to Nate. Everything that we do, you know, all these different effort lines start from commercial market. We aren't inventing anything at DIU. Uh, we simply work with our DOD partners to find out what are the problem areas, where can we help uh, fill in the gaps. Everything comes from the commercial market, and it flows again through Foundry. It flows through Framework, which is one of our Foundry efforts. Uh, or it comes directly into the honor amp to be put on the clear list. But ultimately, the end goal is that we have small U.S. components under framework that are plug and play compatible with systems that uh, are on the clear list that have gotten there through the foundry, which is one of our typically program record type applications, or they went through directly through the honor amp, which is what a lot of folks refer to as Blue UAS. But yeah, um, I'm going to discuss this webinar. Really, I think we have uh, two programs that are uh, uh, represented here. We have the soldier robotic controller effort, which we have um, uh, Stephen on from uh, UXV. And then we'll have our uh, friends from Materian and Doodle Labs on from Blue UAS Framework uh, 1 and 2. So this is a visual on how it all comes together and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a great segue, really. Um, you know, the, the thing that I'm most excited about for this particular panel is just getting so many um, voices that are like inside in the club, so to speak, uh, within the Blue platform, have, or the Blue process having gone through this and and um, staking out a place um, in this diagram that you're sharing. So I'd, I'd love maybe first would be a good place to start would be to bring in um, Stephen Freeberg, um, CEO of UXV Technologies. Um, Stephen, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. I just want to ask you in general, sort of like, what does um, being so involved in the program, what does kind of being a part of this, um, quote unquote, blue UAS ecosystem in a general sense kind of mean to your company? Well, I think it actually means uh, uh, it will have greater market outreach over time. So some of the things that we are doing here is actually harmonizing standards in terms of how ground control stations can be used together with radios. And this is not just the uh, what can we say, the software interface, but this also comes through the electrical interface, mechanical interface, and so on, because there's a lot of different, uh, both radios, but also different technologies that needs to be able to, to work together. Um, in the past, with, with how we operated, each controller then either had the radio dismounted or integrated into it. Uh, with this, what can you say, ecosystem, and with this, uh, the standards, now we can make it interoperable. And this interoperability means a, a, a lower investment to the integrator over time because they only need to use the, the have by the exact controllers and the exact radios that they need for that operation. And so they need to have what we say more uh, integrated systems where you don't have this modularity. So it actually brings a wider outreach of adaptation and also more standardization, which I think is a key when you need to have a developing market and developing technology, which has to, what can you say, has to conform to some of the things where we're moving right now. Yeah, that's great, Stephen. Thank you. Um, and obviously, we will we have time later in the presentation to get into the nitty gritty and talk a little bit more about the technology. But in the meantime, I'd love to pull in um, Nuno Marks, um, Government Engineering Manager for Atirian. Um, Nuno, thanks again for um, joining the panel today. Really happy to have you on. Thanks for the invite. So you have a lot in your role, especially you have a lot of visibility into kind of the needs and demands of, of government agencies that are, are the ones that are asking for this drone technology and ultimately using it as end users. How do you, uh, how would you say that you and your company kind of approach the development of technology for kind of these government and defense use cases um, potentially any differently than you would for like a commercial or industrial customer? Yeah, so as a, as a, as a software platform, we try to, um, make the differences uh, lower as possible. Uh, of course, sometimes that's not possible because of um, certain requirements uh, that are imposed, of course, by 
by the government and we can talk about a little bit of export control stuff and all that uh, but and as a software platform, um, we we try to harmonize as much as possible what we develop for both the, the government side and also for the enterprise side. And as much as we can, we want to make sure that um, both both set of customers um, can enjoy of the same capabilities um, without much burden. But of course, for for government customers, there's certain certain types of certifications and, and, and credentials that we have to take care of before um, before we start development. And of course, during the development, there there are some restrictions in terms of like how we distribute the teams and which team works on in what in what. So yeah, but it's challenging, but it's fun. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting point that you make. It's it's uh, something that everyone on this call kind of holds in common, which is. Um, kind of serving both of those groups uh, as a company, at least umbrella under the larger umbrella, um, really developing um, very specific uh, products that meet the needs of, of DOD, but then also expanding outside of that. And there's some bleed over and we'll be really excited to, to take a deeper look at the Ontario technology and see how that can apply kind of both sides of the fence. Um, I wanted to loop in uh, my colleague, Ashish Parikh. Ash is the, the VP of business development here at Doodle Labs. Um, he worked really directly with DIU and Matthew and the development of um, Doodle Labs Blue US offering the Helix Mesh Rider Radio. Um, Ash, thanks again for um, taking part in the panel today. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. You really uh, twisted my arm from next door. <laughs> <laughs> you better wear that t-shirt, Ash. That's what I said. Anyway, um, I, I want to ask you sort of like, what would you say were your expectations kind of like heading into involvement with the Blue US program? And how has kind of your experience with the program, obviously in the, in the time since kind of compared to those initial expectations? Mm. You know, from from our perspective, I we have nothing but good good things to say about working with um, DIU and the the Blue UAS ecosystem. Um, I also have to mention, you know, working with Matthew has been uh, a real pleasure. He's been managing this um, this program really really well. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure if we would have developed a drone specific radio if not for the draw of this um, ecosystem that they were putting together uh, when, a couple of years ago when they when we first made contact with them. Um, for a, a couple of reasons for that. First of all, DIU um, helped the DOD and I guess the Army more specifically in our case distill its requirements down to a single set. Um, there's so many opinions and there's so many um, use cases in the drone world, drone industry. Um, and so helping us get clarity on um, this is something that you guys should develop. Here's a specific use case um, was very valuable for us. And um, it also gave us confidence that there's probably going to be multiple users of this. Um, the fact that we're joining this ecosystem as opposed to, you know, taking on a design project for, you know, one, spe one specific customer and not knowing, um, you know, how it may be adopted more broadly. Um, and secondly, I'd say like there's been a lot of collaboration and um, brainstorming um, throughout the process, especially in the beginning. Um, Matthew was bringing, um, you know, as I mentioned, he was working with um, the Army to and on S the SRR program to um, distill their requirements. But there was a very um, collaborative dialogue in terms of, hey, let's also talk about what you guys bring to the table. Um, future proofing, like how can we leverage what you guys um, have to have to offer and make sure that it's also brought to the ecosystem, not just about being um, narrow-minded about, um, you know, looking at what, what was requested. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, I think that's like actually a natural transition talking about the technology itself and, and it might not have existed without this program. So, uh, you know, we have the guts of this presentation really, I would love to dive into the technology itself. So I'll share my screen. I know um, Ash has some slides. We have some subsequent, sub, uh, subsequent slides for each of the panelists. We can talk a little bit about the technology itself and, um, you know, get into the conversation a little bit about, especially the collaborative touch points um, where there's crossover between some of the panelists here. So I'll share my screen here once more. And uh, we'll start with your section, Ash. So um, podium's yours. <clears throat> Um, so just like a, a very brief background for um, those of you that aren't familiar with um, Doodle Labs, uh, we develop wireless networking products for autonomous vehicles, robots, connected teams. Our forte is providing reliable high bandwidth links for long range and moving and dynamic situations. Um, our team, we have like 20 years of 
RF experience. And we combine that hardware expertise with a team of networking software engineers. And so we package the hardware and the networking software into solutions for things like you're seeing on this page. Um, you know, we have a pro we have product lineups that um, if you're seeing from you know the left side from that tower over to the drone, so like edge connectivity. Um, we do a lot of long range links, so um, you know things like forty to hundred kilometer links on the on the high end, and also for a lot of mesh networking, which I alluded to, like the the future proofing. Um, that that's also a big part of what we focus on. So. Um, these types of use cases, um, or these, I guess, these types of building blocks are why DIU and the Army collaborated with us in the first place to develop a, 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 a specific radio for drone systems. Um, there were six areas of development that we worked on um, to build out this Helix radio that came out of our, um, out of our partnership and, and is part of this blue UAS ecosystem. Um, and I'll speak to those um, six, um, six development areas in, a, in just a moment. Um, but the result is this Helix platform. And we're re really proud of what has come out of this program. I mean, this radio, we're now shipping in high volumes to Ukraine, the front line. These are things that are being used to, to fly 40 kilometers into enemy territory with very congested spectrum. Um, and on top of that, we've taken this warfighter focused product and we recently released commercial variants uh, of that for the commercial drone ecosystem. And that seems to be filling a gap for high performance links at commercial price points and commercial requirements. Um, I'll walk through some of the development areas that, um, that we worked on as part of this, as part of our collaboration. Um, the first is um, we had to reduce the swap uh, the size and weight of our um, of our radios. So this was the what you're seeing here. If I hold it up, this is our initial embedded module that you're seeing on the left side, and it's represented by this orange box right here. And so I think if I remember, if memory serves me correctly, I think this was around 60 grams or so. And um, what we then shrunk that down to this mini OEM that you're seeing right here. And so this one I think is roughly around 30 grams, depending on the configuration that you're that you're going for. Um, this is this literally this has this essentially is the same as this, but you know, but more. And uh, I'll mention that. But then also, we then got a follow-on request saying for even smaller platforms, can you reduce that even further? And that's what's now our nano OEM here. So that's represented by the the blue box um, over there. Um, then, uh, in terms of um, Another request that was given to us is saying, you know, we had we had radios in this versions of this embedded version that were in both government bands and in commercial bands, and um, but they were all single band radios. And the request was, you know, was that uh, the army has a logistical challenge, you know, when it comes to deploying these um, these vehicles into different um, parts of the world. There's different spectrum allowed um, to, to be used. There's different use cases. And so um, can, can they ask, can you give us a, a radio that can operate in multiple bands? And so what we developed was our multi-band technology, which now on the, exact, on the same radio, we have six bands. And in the Helix specifically, um, we cover 1.6 to 2.5 gigahertz. And so it's user selectable about which band um, the radio operates in. Um, something that, uh, that um, just a preview of what um, Nuno is going to talk about in our Ethereum partnership is, you know, how we visualize this for the user. Um, one of the things that's really exciting that we get, I'm sure a lot of the participants on this, on this um, webinar are, are also interested in is um, uh, about um, channel switching and automatic channel switching based on interference and jamming. And so that's something that we've actually been working on quite a bit. And we're very soon in the coming weeks gonna release um, a feature uh, of that automatically channel switches, but we already have um, a pretty robust spectrum manager that does a, a spectrum scan and um, has a very rapid in a few milliseconds can change channels between these all of these bands right here. Um, the other part, and actually this goes to a lot of what Matthew just talked about, is that it's all about interoperability. And so um, they weren't looking for, um, they needed a, a system or, or components that aren't, you know, using a whole bunch of proprietary interfaces and, 
and things like that. And so ours, we use standard interfaces. Um, so this, we, we are, we're a Qualcomm development partner and we run Linux on our, um, on our, on our system. So uh, it's very, very accessible to a, actually a very low level um, for, for system engineers that are doing the integration. Um, fourth was adding um, security. So uh, we, this is actually something that we proposed about bringing in FIPS 140-3 security. And so this, this also, we were, as we were thinking about it, we're like, what do we need to um, give to the end user so that they're comfortable with the, the security of the radio and of the system itself? And this was um, the standard that, that, was, um, that was chosen. Um, and fifth, uh, this was something that was not in the AOI, but it was something that I know Matthew specifically and DIU is quite interested in in terms of future proofing. So we brought this part to the table because the initial use case and the SRR use case initially is just a point to point link. However, we have a number of mesh capabilities. And so um, what we've been collaborating actually with some of the partners on this call also is how do you um, use Le start leveraging this um, for the more advanced use cases that are coming down the pike. Um, you know, at a very basic level, we, uh, we enable relays so that you're able to extend the range even further or, or in non-line of sight uh, situations. We have broadcast modes where um, a single drone can be uh, transmitting video to a number of different ground users. We have two different versions of mesh, um, which uh, I can go into detail at another time, but the, our fast roaming mesh is a very robust mesh for you know, about uh, 20 or less users. Um, and then we have a fully um, ad hoc mobile uh, network, MNA, um, that we have no, you know, up to 200 nodes, um, uh, no downtime between um, uh, nodes entering and leaving uh, the network. And so even, as I mentioned, so even though this wasn't part of the initial AOI, this is now something that's baked into the product um, that, we, that we release into the ecosystem. The last yeah, bit is, and just, a, and just as a little bit of thing, number six was, it was a very important that we also did a lot of um, uh, partnership and, and um, integrations with, with um, other component vendors. And so um, I'll, I'll, we'll speak to that in, in, the, in the next couple session, sections. Yeah, good segue. Stephen, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Stephen, I'd love to hear from you. Um, get a little bit insight into kind of your offerings in the blue space and then, yeah, dive into the collaboration that we all want to talk about. Thank you very much. So uh, to the people that don't know UHP Technologies, we are a OEM provider of different technologies within robotics and also defense robotics. We offer, we are known to offer a wide shoot of different ground control stations. Um, but what I'm actually going to focus on today is a little bit more on the collaboration with DIU, with uh, uh, Doodle Labs, and also with Arturian. So uh, just a short presentation here, you see some of our different controllers. They come from very small to very big, and then they have different integrations. We also offer different kinds of, what we say, air side modules, where we integrated uh, the Doodle Labs radio, so they also sit on the vehicle and give out the outputs that, what we say, integrators usually prefer. I'm going to go directly into the next slide, please. So um, with our effort together with DIU, um, as Ma Matthew does just mentioned, uh, we have what can say the mentioning of the ISROC program and also the SRM. Uh, SRM comes together with ISROC and ISROC is a more unified controlling platform where you actually have the possibility to load what can say standardized software and also standardized interfaces. Um, I can brought one here. Uh, um, I'm going to just load my video, so it's going to work. Um, but um, we have on the back side the SRM interface, which means swappable radio module. With the swappable radio module, you see an example of that just on below that one, which is the Helix radio. And with this, what can you say, uh, interoperability, it, it gives the completely um, field adaptation to whatever radio that you would like to do. We have a in very extensively worked together with uh, with the DIU uh, over the last I don't know, one and a half to two years on this program, where we have uh, had very close collaboration with both uh, Arturian and also uh, Doodle Labs. Can I get the next slide, please? Uh, before we had the DIU program, uh, then you see how a, a, a normal configuration would look like in the lower right corner. That's where you have the radio directly integrated into the controller 
and then uh, what can you say it's kind of locked together because it's been built like that. Uh, on the picture on the left, you'll see the uh, the SRM module, uh, and you know that's kind of uh, uh, the future within um, uh, uh, radio interoperability. Uh, our collaboration together with Doodlab has been very very uh, important because they have been a partner which has been very innovative but also very uh, focused on seeking new solutions and improvements together with us. Actually, we started uh, formalizing and doing the first integrations more than four years ago. Um, if you see a lot of uh, people that, uh, what can you say, uh, within our customer portfolio that have ch chosen the Doodlabs radio is because they really get a good uh, price to performance. Uh, and, 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 and that's quite superior because they are in a space where uh, both the price and the size fits a lot of the small drones and the small robots uh, where you can find, of course, much more bigger and powerful radios out in the market, but you cannot always fit that package, both on directly on the controller necessarily with the uh, how the standards were in the past, but also on the vehicle. Uh, therefore, this gives some of these the possibilities, especially with the SRM module, uh, SRM standard. Uh, next slide, please. Can, can I, I add something um, onto this? But, yeah, but please just for a moment. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with UXV, and I actually I, one thing that's very unique about UXV is how fast they they prototype and put things together for their customers. It's like completely I've never seen this any in in any other company how fast they're able to put together mechanical um, working prototypes. Um, but even with that being said, what's really cool about our partnership with UXV is that. Um, as both um, flying and ground and terrestrial robot companies uh, approach us for radio links, um, UXV has already integrated our radios with a number of um, their different models. And so they have something out, out, of, the, out of the box that, that, um, that can be used. And so it just kind of goes back to this interoperability um, uh, point between, our, between um, this ecosystem. Yeah, uh, just to uh, what Ash is saying is we have integrated um, Doodlabs radios in all of our platforms, but we also made a lot of different user integrations directly on their platforms too. And uh, uh, I thank you for, 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 for the comment about our speed. Usually uh, that's some of the things which we see as one of our strengths is uh, we, we go right on it and, and uh, we use our extensive experience of working together with you guys of making a, 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 a quick integration, which at this given point of time, it's very important for the market is to be. Next slide, please. You've been working together on holidays, right, Stephen? It is actually National Holidays Day now. <laughs> so uh, yes, both night and day. Um, and uh, we have had also very good collaboration with Arturian, which is also here on the call. Um, I think uh, it's three very important things that has to come together when you, what can you say, uh, uh, separate the platform from 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 the discussion. Then uh, the software which the human interacts with, the hardware they interacts with, and the communication. And uh, that is what can you say the last leg. Uh, uh, what can you say on, on the chair? Uh, we have worked very closely together with the Arturian team, uh, both part on the Ishrock program, but also to make a separate uh, controller for uh, for Arturian, which you might know and uh, know also as the Skynet. Um, and this is in order to accommodate this interoperability uh, when it also comes to, to the software. We work very closely with the software developers and, and most probably Nunu will talk a little bit about that, but uh, on different kind of uh, integrations, both on what's called Arterial Mission Control, but also on uh, things such as uh, um, ATAC and also on the um, 2GC Gov. And this is very important for, it doesn't matter if you have a controller which can uh, what can you say, change its configuration to control multiple vehicles, you also need the software layer, which can actually uh, send these commands and these protocols, which has now been harmonized into the RAS A and the RAS D uh, standards. And, and this has to be visualized also uh, in a way that is very, very uh, user-friendly. Uh, and this has been a, a big pleasure also to work together with Arturian, uh, developing this and also getting field tested and, 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 and constant feedback together with DIU. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of uh, my slides from the UXV side, unless Nuno has something to to, to Altarian, yeah. yeah, Altarian shares the enthusiasm and the pleasure of working with UXV in these programs. 
Nuno, no, I wanted to ask you, um, I think, um, you know, we all kind of, again, share in common being like somewhat component providers, like uh, it's a little bit different, um, a different ballgame than it would be to like um, developing a product that kind of lives in a silo. Like we're, we're all creating products that we know have to interact with other, other things. What's that kind of like development process like, or, or the collaboration of like, not just working within your own walls of your own company, but also coordinating, collaborating with other people outside. I appreciate the love fest between everyone so far, but I also wanted to know kind of what the reality of that looks like and how the approach to that sort of project might be different than something that's contained entirely in, in your own company. Yeah, it's challenging because um, each company has their own um, um, agendas and, and, and product roadmaps. And sometimes uh, making sure that these, uh, these product roadmaps align with um, definitions of st standards and, and definition of interoperability profiles is always tricky, but um, it's the challenge always comes um, with the, the profit of like being capable of um, intro um, or at least being capable of controlling multiple uh, different systems because we have underneath standards that are that support that same interoperability. So it's uh, the challenge is um, usually align programmatic um, requirements with um, with uh, product roadmaps inside these same organizations and even internally sometimes it's difficult it gets a little bit more tricky when we involve multiple companies um, but um, when everyone is actually like understands the the mission and understands the importance of interoperability things uh, become a little bit easier yeah Matthew I want to ask you um, on this topic kind of like obviously the idea of standards, they're kind of rooted, um, uh, you know, seeded from, um, from, regula from regulation, really, regulatory things that come down from the government itself. How mindful are, are you of how tricky or difficult it can be for like all of these separate vendors? They're all working together. They're working toward the same goal here, right? Which is creating these, these end products that are like, you know, um, cleared for use by the DOD. But I have to imagine it can be pretty difficult um, sometimes for the vendors to like align, align with that. How do you um, coordinate that effort and and also from Nuno's perspective, you know, every company works very differently. So I have to imagine your touch points with different companies is quite different. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, answers to that question. It does all stem from making sure that the standards that we put in place don't stray too far from commercial standards and that we're leveraging as much as we can what industry is already doing. Um, and sometimes these aren't standards at all, they're just best practices for development. You know, for example, uh, SROC using the Android operating system, for example, we aren't going to go ahead and invent an OS, right? We're going to leverage what's already out there. And by doing so, take advantage of a lot of work that's already been done. So we definitely look for ways to not reinvent anything, but simply uh, piggyback on top of another technology. I, I think it's obvious in the slide deck so that we're shown so far, but I hope everyone understands the gravity of what has happened here, where we have different programs, right? From different points in time, working on different technologies, but you have a a uh, set of software, ground control and flight control, working together on a controller, which has a modular radio unit developed by a different vendor, and all this comes together into one package. I mean, that that's tough to do. It takes a lot of coordination. It takes a lot of uh, convincing, both, you know, using uh, social capital as well as, uh, you know, capital through DOD contracts. Uh, but it shows that it can work. Uh, it just means that we can't give up. We can't ever assume that this work is too challenging or too hard. It has to be done because ultimately the people who will use this are going to judge it based on not whether it hits a requirement set. It's going to be judged on whether it's usable and whether it's useful. So keeping that in mind is what keeps us all going uh, every single day. Cool. I thought you were describing my efforts to organize this webinar and get everyone on the line at the same time. I was actually so just to say, uh, but, yeah. Embracing a lot of meetings and what can they trying to make the mass happy is something that uh, I think, especially with uh, Nunu and Arturian, uh, with, with uh, keeping all these peers in the loop is, is what can say one of the biggest challenge. So everyone gets uh, what can say the needs fulfilled. On that note, let's open the podium for Nuno. I'd love to hear a little bit about the core technology that um, Arturian is obviously cooking up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, for those who don't uh, know the company, so Ontarian Government Solutions or Ontarian GS is a US-based uh, company with headquarters in Moorpark, California. 
um, that works closely with Altarian Limited, which uh, um, Air headquarters are in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, the company was founded by, by at the end of 2017 by our uh, CEO, uh, Dr. Lawrence Meyer, uh, who is the creator of PixSoc, founder of PX4, co-creator of QGround Control, and one of the main drivers of the, uh, of the Melvin protocol development. Um, and we are aiming to basically re revolutionize uh, how US fleets uh, operate, complete mission zone, and now they collaborate with the, with the connected world. Especially on the government side, we are um, we are helping the US DOD with a better uh, approach for procurement, development, and fielding uh, of drones and autonomous systems. And how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> one of the approaches of the government since uh, mid two uh, thousands is to emphasize the procurement uh, and focus on particular robotic systems with proprietary technology stacks. And this has been the usual approach across the industry, and unfortunately, uh, also most of the DoD robotics and autonomous systems programs. Um, and on this approach, uh, capabilities like GPS denied navigation or uh, obstacle avoidance end up being tied to specific robotic systems, resulting in um, sort of like technical and programmatic vendor lock. Uh, usually, this means that if some capability is desired, the government has, uh, has to be locked into purchase, purchasing the, the robotic system that provides that capability as the system and the capability cannot be separated. But the problem uh, it's, uh, isn't just about the programmatics and the procurement, of course. There's also the technical price that has to be paid uh, because when closed systems are filled at scale and, and put it into operational use, it is rather difficult, um, I would say even impossible to update them with new software capabilities provided by, the, by, by third parties. For example, if a new uh, third party vendor uh, might have a better autonomous na uh, navigation solution than the vendor of the lock lockdown system, but the government, the government will automatically face great technical and programmatic roadblocks if he wants to bring that new capability um, because uh, the, 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 the system is already infilled and the, the infrastructure that is underneath it doesn't allow to do that easily. This approach is usually acceptable when systems, particularly um, UAS systems, could reasonably uh, be uh, thought as uh, mobile cameras or mere mobile cameras. But our position uh, as Otarian is that robotics and autonomous systems are not just mobile cameras but rather uh, autonomous computers, uh, which will increasingly need to easily integrate third-party applications for autonomy, for navigation, object detection, classification, whatever, and also integrate new payloads and sensors in a, in a modular way. Um, the need for a common robotics and autonomous operating system infrastructure and development environment then becomes even more obvious when you consider, for example, the personal computer industry by analogy. Just imagine if uh, computer manufacturers like Dell, Lenovo, HP, et cetera, each had to create their own operating system because Mac OS, uh, Linux distributions, Microsoft Windows, et cetera, didn't exist. The availability and, and, the, and the usability of the software that we rely on these days, uh, the tools that we use, and our ability to share information and collaborate will be greatly diminished. Now, for any imagine that the government and the industry never converge on TCP IP protocols for networking computers together. Uh, this has been unfortunately the state of robotics in the US industry for the last decades, decades with no operating system and, and, and rarely setting up on common uh, communication protocols. Um, Altarian GS and Altarian uh, as, as, a, as a solution provider it solves this problem for robotics and autonomous systems in both the commercial market and, and for governments by offering a common operating system and a development infrastructure based on open standards and an architecture that uh, potentiates uh, modular systems. What this means is that by communizing around Altarian's infrastructure, both um, robotics manufacturers and governments are able to get interoperable products in the field faster uh, and with better capabilities, paired, of course, with automated or workflows um, uh, for many different drones and use cases, which allow data 
coming from in real time from the sensor pipelines to the operator and then to the decision makers. The so our software platform, so our turning software platform, events, uh, enables advanced autonomy and flight capabilities um, through the PX4 flight control stack, uh, which is paired we, uh, with an end to end work workflow that is powered by Autarian OS, which is our operating system, Autarian Mission Control, and our cloud solution, Autarian Suite. Uh, the software platform provides um, uh, modular payload, radios, uh, data link support through a software defined approach and standardized inter interfaces. Um, of course, on top of uh, on the top right side of the slide, you, pro you guys probably already saw this, saw this in the past, or you're following, or you're already users of this hardware. You can see the the, the hardware that powers um, our software platform that runs on the robotic system, which is the Altarian SkyNode, uh, the Altarian flagship avionics platform. Uh, it's a combination of a flight controller and an onboard mission computer. Um, the flight controller side runs PX4 flight, the flight controller stack, while the mission computer runs our operating system material OS. One of the premises is that um, all the robots uh, with SkyNode can be controlled with the same ground control software and can run the same onboard applications. Uh, we provide plug and play support for several smart and tactical data links, which of course includes Google Labs smart radios. And we also provide um, pl plug and play support via ISR payloads uh, like Trillium, NetsVision, et cetera, um, that we actually enable full feature payload integration more than just, uh, for example, pan basic pan tilt, zoom control, et cetera. And we might be talking about, for example, gimbal modes, inverting IR polarity, uh, tracking, et cetera. Um, to highlight also that SkyNode passed rigorous cybersecurity evaluations for the US government programs and it's uh, NDA compliant and remote ID compliant. On the bottom left, uh, on the bottom right corner, um, uh, and in collab collaboration with UXV, um, you can see um, uh, the two GCS hardware solutions we provide the SkyNav and the SkyNav Lite. Uh, these are solutions we provide to our government customers and that we pair uh, uh, with our mission planning and control station software, Alteran Mission Control. Uh, we are closely working with UXV, uh, as I led by, Steve, uh, by Stephen, on the software to be deployed on the ASTROC controller. I would ask to change to the next slide, please. Um, in Alteran GS, we consider ourselves as the honest broker and trusted partner for the Department of Defense, the IU, and the UAS program. Altarian ideal role will be sort of like an architect um, uh, and a neutral party where uh, our operating system powers robotics and drones across uh, a diverse fleet made by different manufacturers uh, will basically had additional capabilities on top of the operating system. And of course, differentiate in terms of the hardware. So we can talk about like platforms that have different ranges, different endurances, et cetera. Um, for DIU and the DOD, um, Altarian provides a technical leadership, architecture, and coordination for standardization. One of the applications of this technical leadership and coordination is uh, what we are doing currently with, uh, with res -A, with the uh, uh, Robotics and Autonomous Systems Interoperability Profile, where we are working with the government and, and, and industry partners to develop the the next standard of interoperability profile to be under the umbrella of the Department of Defense Joint Reference Architecture and to be, of course, adopted by the WAS vendors. Um, we are also responsible for ground control station software architecture, uh, development and maintenance um, uh, as we build software for WAS and help setting the standards that drone companies select by the US DOD are required to adopt and use. Uh, the most obvious uh, case in, is QGC Gov, uh, the Q ground control that is tailored for government usage, and it is built to answer um, the most uh, to the most advanced requirements and capabilities needs from the from the government side. It provides mission planning and multi multi vehicle control capabilities, uh, besides the support to multiple data links and communication with uh, tech networks. QGCGov is owned by the government. Um, it's maintained by Otarian uh, and enables development of capabilities not only by Otarian, but also by 
other parties involved in contracts with the government. Um, it's sort of like an open source development for the US government partners and, and customers. We also provide, of course, as, as Stephen made reference to alternative mission control, um, which our, it's our, it's our uh, mission planning and vehicle control application. And we provide it to different US DOD customers, uh, usually bundled and delivered uh, with uh, our Altarian SkyNav hardware. Last but not least, Altarian also provides uh, software and hardware, of course, uh, infrastructure to the different vendors um, that have their platforms being used by government customers, especially with the DOD. And these, of course, includes, include uh, everything that is VOAS platforms. I will move to the next slide. Thank you. So in our collaboration with um, with uh, we do the labs, uh, we provide a full radio configuration through an embedded driver. So we uh, interact directly uh, with uh, with the radio internals to the API that uh, do the labs provide, and we basically support um, uh, configuration of the of the labs smart radios, which also include the Elixir and. Um, there are two main there are two main components actually three main components that I wanted to emphasize. Here. One is when we talk about uh, configuration, we're talking about uh, an easy to use process where by the press of a button uh, you can basically pair two radio two radio links. Uh, that requires, of course, that both sides implement the same pairing protocol. Um, but this protocol, of course, is standardized and is defined by the RAS AOP. Uh, where where the first iteration was um, sort of designed and developed under the IU's SRR program and for the first uh, for BlueAS 1.0, uh, it has meanwhile evolved for to provide better experience and, and easy integration uh, and implementation, of course, for the, by the different vendors. But it's uh, it's uh, it's the the good thing about it is it's like you press a button, you have two radio, you have two radios, you can pair two radios without having to directly access the web page configuration of the radio to, to set up this. And we apply this to the labs radios, but also to other smart and tactical radios. Other two um, things that Ash already made reference to are two capabilities that we also developed under the Astro program. One is the smart radio mesh visualization, which allows us to see the, the mesh uh, uh, on, on the UI of QGCGov. Uh, and the other one is the smart radio frequency scan that allows us to basically select the best frequency on a specific provided band. And that's all from my side. Hey, can I just add uh, another comment here? Um, which is that the, the, um, the spectrum scan that, you, that he's referring to on the right side is, is um, something I, I alluded to earlier that we're working on quite a bit. And I think it's of quite a bit of interest to, to people on this call. So essentially what you're seeing on the right side is a scan of the six bands that are, um, that are available to, to the user. And what the radio also does is it provides a signal um, which can be used to then uh, trigger a change in the channel very rapidly if needed. Um, the, the, what's coming in the very near future is, uh, is actually an automatic version of this where um, the radio itself can do this automatically. However, in the current version, it's already quite useful because this provides the, the, um, the input to the user to decide if and when they wanna do that strategically depending on how the, how the radio is being used. Great. Um, we're running a little bit short on time. Um, there's there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is we've gotten a ton of really great questions um, from the audience. Some are specific, um, some are a little more broad in general. I think what we can do is we'll follow up with everyone directly for uh, to address their questions on a one-to-one -one basis, but there's enough there that I think we'll probably spin up a Doodle Labs blog post very shortly off the back of this just to address a lot of those. But in the, in the short time that we have left, I'd love to just um, you know, talk to each of the panel members, um, maybe keep it to like a tweet length um, response if you can. Um, everyone did a great job promoting this webinar in the lead up on social media, so that shouldn't be too tough for you. But um, maybe just a, a few words about kind of the future of, um, you know, your involvement in Blue US and specifically like this sort of collaborative nature, kind of what you see coming around the corner. Maybe Matthew, I'll start with you. Yeah, we're just getting started and we couldn't do it without the help and support from innovative vendors like you're seeing on this call, as well as those that are on the on the participants list here. So uh, keep it up, um, talk with us, let's, let's keep work together. Steven? 
Uh, I have to agree with Matthew. Um, we are just in the early stages. We have a long roadmap of more and more equipment, which will, of course, be into a standalone sphere and also leverage from, from, from where we started uh, with, with DIU. Uh, we believe in that vision, but also uh, it's nice to see a lot of familiar names on the participants list. So that means that there's a lot of people here in, in a small community that uh, is all following and, and seeing what we're doing. And you know? Yeah, final remark is that um, it's a it's a pleasure to be working with uh, with the industry and with the government in, in setting the, the future of of autonomous systems and 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 bring every everyone into the same page regarding um, regarding standardization and, and collaboration. So really happy to see a lot of participants here listening to what we have to, to share um, and what technologies are we working on. Always setting the setting the path to um, really great future of autonomous autonomous systems. Great, and Ash, last but not least. Um, yeah, this has been it's it's a real pleasure partnering with um, DIU and the other partners within the ecosystem. And um, looking forward, this is also a big strategic focus for Doodle Labs as well as um, focusing on ecosystems and integrating very closely with with um, partners in each one of them. Cool, yeah, I, I, closing thoughts for me is um, we're gonna be talking about this topic quite a bit more at Doodle Labs um, in the next couple of months, especially in the run up to a VSI's exponential show um, where we'll be on the show floor um, discussing this further on. Um, like I mentioned, we'll follow up with any of the direct questions that we've gotten. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for AAVSI for hosting. Um, thank you so much um, for UXV, uh, Tyrion, um, joining us in Doodle Labs as well as DIU for this um, talk. If you have any other questions, feel free to follow both directly afterward. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for, for attending and I'll pass it back to AVSI. Thanks so much. And as Nate pointed out, please plan to join us in May in Denver for Exponential. Should be a great time, a lot of great learning, a lot of great tech. Um, on behalf of AVSI, I'd like to thank you all for participating today. It was a great discussion. Obviously, a lot of questions that came through, so um, expect that follow-up, everyone. Attendees, you're going to receive a link to access the webinar recording within the next week. Another exciting new feature is that all of our webinar recordings are now available on AVSI's learning and engagement platform, ABLE. When you receive the viewing link, there will be additional information about accessing the recording and slides. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Doodle Labs and DIU, once again, for their generous support of today's webinar. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Doodle Labs, once again, um, just for really engaging with us and being present at Exponential. Looking forward to that. If you have additional questions or comments or ideas for webinars, please feel free to email us at education at auvsi.org. Lastly, today's program is copyrighted by AUVSI with all rights reserved. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. <laughs>